Hello, everyone. I'm Osana Lubigivna, a fourth year PhD student at K here at KU Mohela Academy. I'm really excited today to be hosting our second to last webinar, which is the fifth webinar of the series Pohled Zobni. A look from the outside, I'm organizing on behalf of the Postgraduate Society of KU Mohela Academy. The series is devoted to the Ukrainian topics in linguistics, geography, history, and political science reflected in publications of prominent researchers who work in the US and UK academic environments. Our goal is to look at Ukrainian issues from the outside to enrich one's perspective with new approaches, methods, and perhaps a way of thinking. And um, I'm really thrilled to have a wonderful speaker, Professor Raffensperger from Wittenberg University with us today to talk on the topic uh, revising Kiev and Rus from the, for the 21st century. Now, the way we are going to hold the event, um, we are going to have an introductory word by Professor Pevne, a talk, and then I will post questions coming from you. I would like to remind everyone that you are invited to ask questions by putting them in our chat, or you can ask them directly by, writing, by raising your hand. And then now it's uh, just my pleasure to turn the floor over to Professor Pavne from Cambridge University, UK, whose um, research interest lies primarily in the area of the art and culture of Kevin Rus and Ruthenia, who is a colleague and friend to introduce him. Professor Pavne, please. Thank you. So hello everyone, and thank uh, thank you for joining us this morning, evening, uh, afternoon. I don't know where everyone is. Um, my name is Olen Kapevny, and I am associate professor of medieval and early modern Slavonic studies and director of the Ukrainian Cambridge Studies uh, wait the Ukrainian Studies program at uh, Cambridge, the University of Cambridge. So I am absolutely delighted to attend this seminar. And I want to congratulate Olena and Oksana on organizing this seminar and particularly today's events. And it is also a great pleasure to speak to you or to introduce Professor Christian Raffensberger. So Professor Christian Raffensberger uh, might be a leading scholar of Rus to all of you, and he is that to me as well, but he's also a very good friend. And I think it's important to stress this because in addition uh, to being immersed in his own research. One of the things that's special about Professor Raffensperger is that he's one of these scholars who always gives back to the field and who always has your back. So through his publications, his lecturing, and his work with students, he has done much to support others in medieval Slavic studies and has really tirelessly promoted Rus studies both in North America and in Europe. Professor Raffensperger's publications are significant and timely in both their focus and breadth. He analyzes written and material medieval sources in the context of cultural and political networks of exchange that link nodes of cultural production in Europe. His detailed empirical work brings to light new evidence regarding medieval court culture and emphasizes the fluid cultural discourses among various geographical localities in Europe. So, but most significantly, I think, is that his work really challenges longstanding dichotomies, such as the division of medieval Europe into Western and Eastern or Catholic and Orthodox. So his fresh perspective on marriage alliances within an extended European framework challenges uh, the peripheral positioning of places such as Ireland, the Scandinavian and Slavonic worlds in the field of medieval European studies. In his book, Reimagining Europe, Cave in the Rus in the Medieval World, that came out in 2012, uh, in Ties of Kinship, Genealogy, Dynastic Marriage in Cave in the Rus, came out in 2016, and in the Kingdom of Rus, 2017, Professor Raffensperger debunks the notion of an Eastern other and paints a picture of Rus lands as dynamically embroiled in discursive political, economic, religious, and dynastic European realities. 
his publications have discredited the ensconced image of Rus as an orthodox entity isolated from the rest of Europe, a Cold War uh, vision of Europe projected onto the Middle Ages. Thus, while his publications rest on laborious probing of Rus chronicles and numerous other medieval written and material sources, they also expose biases embedded in quote unquote Western publications covering Rus history and in the terminology employed in these texts. For example, Professor Raffensperger differentiates among the modern states of Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia, and does not project modern national identities onto the past by equating Rus with Russia. It is my understanding that Dr. Raffensperger currently is working on another book project that aims to geographically reorient the study of the political culture of medieval Europe. Through th thematic analyses of succession, titulature, dynastic, and ecclesiastical relations, this upcoming project will interrogate the division of medieval cultures into cores and peripheries, and will attempt to purge modern national conceptions from the study of European medieval history. Today, Professor Raffensperger will deliver a talk entitled Revising Kiev and Rus for the 21st century. This talk, I assume from the um, abstract, is going to challenge two assumptions about medieval Eastern Europe. One, that Rus polities were isolated from the rest of Europe, and two, that Rus polities were subject to constant and destructive infighting. So it is indeed my great pleasure uh, to introduce Professor Raffensperger to you and to give him the floor for his lecture. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to thank everybody involved in this who all are named uh, Aliana, Aliana, Alianka, Oksana. Um, thank you all for setting this up, for making this uh, possible. Alianka, thank you so much for such a wonderful uh, introduction. Um, and it sets up the talk very nicely as well, I believe, too, because as you know, I'm going to try and challenge two traditional assumptions about medieval Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, I'm being very self-promoting here in my first slide. Uh, hopefully you can all see the PowerPoint presentation um, because the, the two assumptions that I'm challenging, I, I've challenged a little bit in these books. And so I'm gonna draw from that material for the talk today. The first, as Olianka noted, is that Rus was not a disconnected group of polities, but instead was one kingdom akin to what we see elsewhere in Europe and the second is that Rus in Eastern Europe more broadly um, was not riven by uh, internecine conflict. And I'll talk more about that when we get there. But certainly if you look up uh, almost any uh, Anglo-American uh, textbook, that's what you'll see uh, is this idea of, of uh, internecine conflict. Instead, I'm gonna suggest that individuals across polity boundaries utilize their kinship relationships to engage in conflict with one another and that those conflicts rarely included royal deaths. So to begin, I wanna talk about this idea of a kingdom of Rus. And um, in Anglo-American historiography, medieval European studies has been constructed in a particular way. And it's been constructed largely in a line of what um, used to be quite common in university education of Western civilization. So uh, once upon a time, there was Greece and the invention of democracy, and then there was Rome and the advent of empire. Uh, and then, you know, something else happened, we don't know, uh, the Dark Ages, but eventually England, right? And there was Magna Carta in 1215 that created the rule of law. And then England spawned, of course, the culmination of all of these things, the city on a hill that is the United States of America. Usually there's a sound effect that goes along with this, like, ah, you know, there's a, a, a auditory halo. Um, so Anglo-American studies has, has positioned medieval Europe on this road between Rome and England, so that England is largely the uh, normative example given uh, for medieval Europe. And certainly, if you look historically at medieval European studies, that's what you see, is you see England and, to a lesser extent, France, and of course, connections with the papacy. 
coming out of that, and I've actually written a lot of historiography lately uh, for various uh, articles and purposes, you'll see a, um, a, a rebuttal to that. Not changing it though, but creating their own world. And so um, the Slavic studies organizations in the Anglophone world were created as a, let's, let's also have a focus here. Byzantine studies was created as an organization, let's have a focus here. And what ended up happening is silos. So there's a silo of medieval European history, a silo of Slavic studies, and a silo of Byzantine studies. And um, as, as you all know who are here, right, actually in the medieval world, there was intercourse between all of those groups. But because of the way historiography was constructed and academia has been constructed, those are three separate fields. And I mean, you can see this in everything from the way textbooks are written and sold, jobs are advertised, um, even monographs are published. You know, um, if I want to get a book published, I can't go to the medieval studies editor typically. Um, they'll send me to the Slavic studies editor or the Byzantine studies editor. Um, you know, I have stories of all kinds from colleagues of trying to get medieval studies books published and, and it doesn't particularly work that well. So what I would like to do is I would like to take Rus out of that Slavic studies world and put it into a medieval studies world. And that's going to give us a different set of priorities and challenges. And to kind of ground that a little bit in the, um, the discussion a little bit, I want to show you a series of maps about medieval Europe. So this is my first, oh, if I can make this work. Okay, there it is, there, okay. My first map, um, these next two maps, this one and the following are from a very popular um, medieval Europe textbook that is in its, I think, fourth edition now. Um, you can see this is the early Middle Ages. We've got some cities in England, uh, the Anglo-Saxons. We've got a lot of cities in France, some in the Italian peninsula, some in the Saxon territory. Um, Poland, Bohemia, Hungary each get a name, but there are no cities there. Um, and then of course, the place that we all are most concerned with is hidden by the legend. Uh, so. Aliena, I'm sorry, but you're hidden by the legend. Um, so this is a problem. Uh, even Constantinople gets one dot and the rest is just the Byzantine Empire. This is a two page map in the book. Um, and the right hand page is the legend and a bunch of blank space. All of the cities are on the left hand map. So this is the early middle ages. If we want to progress and say, okay, things are gonna get better in the high middle ages, they don't, they get worse. Um, we have a lot of cities in France. The Holy Roman Empire is now just one line. Um, there's a lot of cities in Italy. Prague, right, all of a sudden Prague, we get a city there, but Bohemia, Hungary, and Poland have disappeared. The Byzantine Empire has disappeared. And of course, there's still nothing in Eastern Europe. Now, this textbook is a problem, but it is also incredibly representative. Um, it is a, uh, its contents, the contents of the textbook mirror these maps, as you might imagine. And imagine if you are an 18 to 21 year old student reading this textbook in your medieval Europe class, what is medieval Europe? It's just France and England. Oh, and the Italian peninsula, right? There is nothing in the Eastern half. And the publisher went to all the trouble to publish a two page map with nothing on the right hand page. So this is a problematic view of the world. However, there are other maps, but they have problems too. And so one of the maps that has at least some Eastern Europe also has different problems. So this is a map um, in an atlas that is uh, widely used for medieval studies. And you can see if we proceed from west to east, um, once again, England has a lot of cities. France not only has cities, but it has all kinds of interior territories. We've got the Duchy of Aquitaine. We've got the County of Brittany, the County of Toulouse. Burgundy is a separate kingdom, the Kingdom of Italy, uh, the Kingdom of Germany, right, as part of the empire. Uh, we have multiple internal territories there. And as we move farther to the east, 
Now we just have the Duchy of Poland, no internal divisions, a couple cities, the Kingdom of Hungary, um, one internal division and only a couple of cities. And then we get to this amorphous mass that is this mustard yellow of Russia. Problematic, obviously. Again, no internal divisions, a few cities, no kingdom, duchy, county, anything like that, trying to delineate what this territory is, um, and much less detail than any of the other places. So it is an advantage over the other maps that I was showing you in that there is at least something on the eastern half of the map, but it is still uh, not a particularly good map to try and represent what's going on in medieval Europe. And one of the big reasons that we have this is because of that trajectory I was talking about before. There is so much focus on England and France in medieval European studies, and England in particular in the Anglophone scholarship gets the lion's share of attention. And because it does, the picture is created of England as the normative medieval polity. England, largely from the time of Alfred the Great's children, so early 10th century, has coinage that is minted from both the central mint as well as regional mints. They have tax collection in a broad area originally intended to pay tribute to the Danes uh, in the Dane law. They had a territorial breakdown into organized segments, uh, the shires and the hundreds. They had a representative from the king who is in each shire, so the shire reeve, which is where we get this word sheriff. They had a system of vernacular writing and record keeping. Uh, the picture then of England that you'll see in a lot of literature is what makes a medieval state, right? And the things that I've given you all sound like things that a state should do. They fit the definitions that you see in texts, including, of course, uh, Weber, right? However, England is not the only polity in medieval Europe. So let's take a look at a second polity, right? In this one, there's a king, someone with the title Rex, and we'll talk more about titles in a minute who claims authority over a broad territory. Even though in keeping with medieval tradition, the title is king of a people, not king of a land. There is no broader system of taxation. There is no system of coinage. There is no unified law code. The subordinate rulers are not actually very subordinate and do what they want most of the time. One of the few times they come together is when there is an invasion and the king is able to mobilize the forces to fight together. More often they're engaged in war or rather conflict with one another. In fact, this is so pervasive that in one example, the king has to ask one of his subordinates to have a peace conference at which multiple persons attend. And the first subordinate is the mediator, not the king who is just on the sidelines. So what is this second polity? Rus, perhaps? No, it's actually France, right? France in the 11th century. The king of France, or really the Rex Francorum, rules over just a small piece of territory himself, the Ile de France, and doesn't control most anything else in the entire territory. And yet, if you look at it on this map, you see the kingdom of France as if it is a unity ruled by a king who gets to determine everything. This then is the reality of medieval Europe. England is not normal. Instead, it's highly abnormal. And yet it has been taken as the norm that all other medieval polities aspire to. And France actually has gotten swept up alongside it and been considered just like England in many ways. The reality is that the majority of Western Europe doesn't have what England has until the second half of the 12th century. France doesn't even have what Anglo-Saxon England did until the early part of the 13th century. And yet, we hold in our heads a model of medieval Europe where France and England are centralized kingdoms ruled by powerful kings who have vassals who bow down before them. France and England go to war. France and England tax. France and England represent the normative model of political development, all of which leads to the modern nation state, coincidentally called France and England. But it turns out they're not normal. England is abnormal um, and it's an outlier, right? We only use it as normal because of our uh, Anglo-American heritage. So if we take away the normativity of these models and we look again at Rus, not as a failed England or as a proto-Russia, we can adjust our picture of it and see that it fits very nicely into an 11th century medieval European world. It is not, as a recent textbook called it, quote, a mafia-like network of merchants and warlords, end quote, 
but a kingdom, just like others throughout Europe. So to talk about Rus, I want to talk about terminology, because terminology matters when discussing medieval as well as modern history. And there are multiple ways to discuss titulature, um, including the study of titles that the Rus used for themselves. So that's where we're going to start. Now, the most common of these titles is kinyas, right? Um, a kinyas is uh, somebody who is a ruler. This is the root definition of this word. It comes from Indo-European. It shares um, roots with Koninger uh, in Old Norse, Kuning in Anglo-Saxon, um, even King in modern English, right? We also have Veliki Kinyas, which actually is pretty rare in the Kievan period. Only later does it gain currency as a common title. It um, can be used as a descriptor for dead rulers to demonstrate their sanctity. The same is true for Tsar. Tsar will pop up in the Kievan period, um, also in the same way to describe a dead ruler and emphasize their sanctity. Rex appears in Latin sources as the most common descriptor uh, of Russian rulers. Interestingly though, of course, um, even though we see this uh, title of Rex used for Russian rulers. It's not always translated that way uh, as king. We'll come back to that. Um, of course, I mean, I could quote a dozen different examples, but my favorite, of course, is Thietmar of Merseburg, who is a contemporary of uh, Volodymyr uh, Svetoslavich. Um, and he calls Volodymyr Rex, even though he doesn't like him because he also calls him Fornicatur Mensis, right? And so you don't need a whole lot of Latin to follow that. Um, but so Thietmar of Meersburg is just one of the many sources that ref uh, refers to Russian rulers as rex or reges. Scandinavian sources in, written in Old Norse refer to the Russian rulers as koninger. Um, and actually, almost all of the Scandinavian sources do refer to the Russians, given the connections between uh, the first Russians and the Scandinavians, as well as the ongoing marital connections that we see in the 11th and 12th centuries. The Heimskringla, the Morkenskinna, the Fagerskinna, all refer to the ruler of Rus as a Koninger. In fact, there's a, there are some really nice passages like in, in Heimskringla, uh, where we see the 12th century rulers of Rus, Denmark, and Norway, all referred to as Koninger in one sentence, right? So they are all placed uh, equally on, a, on the same uh, title. So we're seeing a consistent picture is what I'm trying to get across. Now, there are multiple titles, though. So these are not the only titles that could be used in medieval Europe. And the best place to look for that is in the letters of the papacy, because the papacy writes to everybody trying to get involved in their business. And so we see here, um, Karl Werner uh, has analyzed the register of Pope Gregory VII on titles. And this quote sums that up. Right? A glance at the register of Gregory VII is enough to show a true picture of 11th century conditions. There are 152 lay addressees in Gregory's register, including, besides 45 kings, 80 princes, the Dukes of Poland and Bohemia, the princes of Salerno, Capua, and Benevento, Dukes Beatrix, Duke Godfrey, and the Margravess Matilda, the Doge of Venice, Duke Robert Giscard of Apulia, Calabria, and Sicily, Margrave Azo of Esta, the Dukes of Swabia, Bavaria, Carinthia, Lotharingia, and Saxony, the Margrave of the Saxon Eastmark, the Dukes of Normandy, Aquitaine, and Burgundy, the Counts of Flanders, Brittany, Blois, Champagne, Anjou, Toulouse, and Provence, to name only the most important. Gregory wrote to the Russian rulers too, and where do they fit into this? As Rex, right? So they are kings, at least according to the Pope. And he had a whole host of titles at his disposal. One of the big problems with this uh, for Russian rulers in the modern imagination is that king has come to have the connotation of sole ruler. And in fact, the denotation, if you look at the Oxford English Dictionary of monarch, right? Sole ruler, literally. But that's really not what the word means originally. It just means ruler. And we get this problem not just in Rus, but throughout medieval Europe. Scandinavia in about the year 800 has 45 different people who are called Koninger. Modern scholars then, when they're writing about this, often choose to call some of those kings and others they call chiefs, 
even though in the original language, they all bore the same title of Koninger. Ireland is even worse. They have no less than 150 kings at any one time from the 6th to the 12th century. Um, these re, uh, the uh, old Irish word, pose problems for modern Anglophone scholars who often resort to chieftain, thinking that there's no way there can be 150 kings. For Irish specialists, though, they simply acknowledge the multiplicity of kings and they move on to discussing what they do, who they are, etc. Even in the heartland of Europe, Janet Nelson uh, notes that Hank Mar of Rems discussing the Franks of the Carolingians note that there were, quote, many regna and several kings, but only one regnum francorum, end quote. Even in England, right, Alfred the Great is a rex who has reges, other kings who are subordinate to him, and there's no problem with that. So we have instances from our main sources for the 11th and 12th century Rus of Kenyazia going to war against Kenyazia, and that's okay. Similarly, we have Latin sources that note the situation explicitly, such as Abbot Wilhelm writing in the 12th century who says, quote, nam plures ibi rege sunt, for there are many kings there. Wilhelm didn't have a problem with the fact that there are many kings there. He was just noting it as a fact of life for Rus. Now, there are other examples I could go into to talk about this, but um, we then need to break our understanding of king as monarch to try and understand king as ruler. In the medieval world, there were multiple reges, just like there were multiple koninger and multiple kinyazia, and that's okay. Now, given that I'm trying to challenge two assumptions today in this talk, I don't have time to get into all the duties of the kinyazia, um, but I want to talk at least about why this translation matters, right? The, the big so what question. Now, first off, the, the answer to that is this is what the primary sources say, and we should care about what the primary sources say. Uh, James Brundage, in his excellent translation of the 13th century Latin source, Henry of Livonia, takes the terminology for Russian rulers and deliberately changes it. Henry of Livonia refers to all the Kinyazia as reges, so the rex of Polotsk, or the rex of Gerzica. Brundage translates Rex uniformly throughout his text as king. But when he gets to the Russian rulers who are titled Rex by his author, uh, Brundage adds a footnote, quote, like the king, pardon me, king of Polotsk, the king of Gerzica was a Russian prince. Or when referring to the Christianizer of Vladimir, he says, Vladimir was a Russian prince, not a king as Henry calls him, end quote. Just listen to the tone and the challenge that Brundage offers. Brundage is deliberately changing what his source says as a way to affect our reading. Now, I, I'm not saying that his intent is negative, not at all. Probably he's trying to offer what he thinks of as a corrective, but instead he's changing the source and he's affecting our perception of who these Russian rulers were. If king is the normative definition of rex for rulers throughout medieval Europe, then this is the title that should be applied equally throughout medieval Europe, whether the rulers are Rex, Koninger, or Kinyas. A deliberate lowering of titles affects our modern perception, and thus we end up with the King of France, the Emperor of Germany, the Duke of Poland, and the Prince of Rus. This creates a hierarchy that did not exist at the time when these individuals were peers and acted as such. Dynastic marriage would be just one example of this when Russian princesses were the queens of France, Poland, Hungary, and Norway all in the 11th century, and later that century one as the empress of the German Empire. Thus, I would encourage us to consider the importance of both framing and titulature. We study history through the sources, and our selection of sources is, is mediated by where we start and where we're going. If we're looking at Rus as the predecessor to Russia, as so often happens in Slavic studies, then we'll see one set of sources in one picture of Rus as part uh, not a state like Russia or Muscovy, right? If instead we frame Rus as part of medieval Europe, it suddenly looks normal, not aberrant. It has features that other people have at the same time. It intermarries with them, travels and trades, has religious connections with them, and exists in a contemporary chronological world. In so doing, we should examine the political structures not of a later period, but of the contemporary one in which we find Rus and utilize those structures and that titular titulature to construct the polity known as Rus, 
And so doing, we find a kingdom of roots, which hopefully um, at least takes a step to correcting an omnipresent image in at least Anglophone scholarship. So this is the first of these uh, challenges I wanna make to an assumption about Russian history. Moving on to our second assumption, the idea that Kievan Rus in Eastern Europe in general is rife with internecine warfare and bloodshed. Um, this too actually comes from the same root, the idea that England is somehow a normative example of the Middle Ages, it's centralizing and it's peaceful, right? The latter part of which is certainly not true. Um, and other places can't meet that standard as well because that standard is simply false. Now, one of the things that drew me into thinking about this issue of conflict is the work that I did on dynastic marriages that uh, Alenka mentioned. Part of that comes through the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute's uh, MAPA project. And I've given you the URL for this MAPA. Um, this is a, a list of, or a visual representation of the marriages made by Russian individuals in the 11th and 12th century. Each of these lines in the actual MAPA is clickable and will take you to links to learn more about the sources for and the information on each of those um, uh, marriages. And it, if you're interested in, in Ukrainian history, which I assume you are given your presence here, um, you should look at the MAPA project in general if you haven't seen it. So these are all marriages between individuals. They're not about Rus or certainly not about Russia. They're not about Poland or Germany or Hungary. They're about peoples and families. So this kind of horizontal connectivity, not the silos I was talking about earlier, is what really got me thinking about these kinds of interactions. To talk more about that, I want to introduce a couple of concepts which I hope will allow us to think a little bit differently about medieval kinship relations and maybe even medieval political relations in general. The first of these is a term that I call the kinship web. A kinship web is all of your natal and marital kin. So all the kin you are born with and the kin you gain through your marriage. And it is recognized in this period. We have this great quote from Nicetus Coniates in his history. Quote, as the emperor Andronicus I Komnenos was growing unpopular and the Republic was speaking out against him, he convened a council of state which decreed the execution of his political enemies and their families. His own son Manuel opposed this, arguing that the decree, if literally enforced, would lead to the death of the entire Roman population, and not merely of all the Romans, but of foreigners too. Specifically, he argued that the family of one of the accused would lead from one relation to the next in an endless chain of affiliation until all Romans were killed and the number of victims would eventually be infinite." End quote. Now, Manuel was slightly exaggerating if the words are actually his, but the concept is sound. There was an immense horizontal interconnectivity throughout elite families in particular. In fact, in this example, more than some foreigners would have died as during this period, the elite of Southeastern Europe were becoming increasingly connected to the Komneni through marriage. Largely what I've done is follow this prescription and suggest that we can connect elites in this way to provide a base web of relationships. The people in that web are your kin, right? Natal and marital. You can call on them for assistance or they can call on you for assistance. Now, this was too was a difficulty acknowledged in the medieval world as John Ducas advised Nikephras Botaniates that the benefit of marrying Maria of the Alans was that she had no bothersome family connections requiring aid. The positives and negatives of the kinship web depended on, on many occasions merely upon whether one was asking or being asked for assistance. Those people in your web are also people with whom you can fight or who may fight you. But We'll leave that to our situational kinship webs in a moment, networks in a moment. I believe that this idea, kinship webs, should be pretty non-controversial. There are people with whom you share a marital or a natal bond. The web might stretch from Rus to France, which met with marriages all along the way. But it does actually also point out some odd lacunae. For instance, in the 11th and 12th centuries, there are very few marriages between South Slavic rulers and East Slavic rulers. We can connect them through multiple uh, marriages, but th there's nothing direct, which itself is something interesting and worthy of study. Where we end up with then is a base set of kinship relationships, not delineated or defined by national, ethnic, or state identity. And this shift in thinking can be seen if we look at just a few 
different representations of famine. The traditional representation might have a, a Rurikid, I actually use Volodymyrovichi. Um, the Rurikid is a 15th and 16th century construct, so I use Volodymyrovichi, the family of Volodymyr, um, that only includes people from that family. So if you look here, this is Mstislav Harold Volodymyrovich, Kristin Inga's daughter, right, and some of their children and their marriages. Other people can marry in, but their connections to their original family are lost. Okay. Can you see my cursor? Oksana, can you see the cursor? Yeah, okay. Right, so Boleslav IV here marries in to Verkhoslava. Boleslav IV appears from nowhere on this chart. He has no familial connections because the familial connections of this chart are all based around the Volodymyrovichi. But if we look at the Polish side, here we have a Polish family tree. Um, and Boleslav IV, once again, is here, and he's connected into a family, but Verkhoslava now is not connected into any family. She appears from nowhere and is now a member of this Polish Mishkovici line. Right? We could do the same with the Arpods. Here we've got Arpods where we have another Mishko. Here's a Mishko uh, III, right? married in, coming from nowhere. Yefrasinia married in, coming from nowhere. In each of these instances, we've privileged one linear connection, uh, Volodymyrovici, Mishkovici, Arpad, and their people marry in and they lose that connection to somewhere else. That's not the way it was. This is the way it was. These are all three of those same charts, Volodymyrovici, Mishkovici, Arpad, all melded into one. So we can see that Boleslav IV here is connected into a Polish family, Verkoslava is connected into our Russian family. And so all of these are now melded into one particular chart, a horizontal network of familial connections, a kinship web counting for both natal and marital connections. Now, this isn't just a graphically interesting way to examine this material. I actually think this is the way they thought about it. Um, and we have no, admittedly, we have no first person accounts from the 11th and 12th century that say this but we can examine the way they acted and even some of the language that they used to show that this is the case. Now with this kinship web as our backdrop, we can talk about practical interactions and conflict. And conflict is important to emphasize here because I like this term better than war. The connotations of war are simply too big for the medieval conflicts that I'll be discussing. Instead of mass battles of thousands of men, we're typically talking just about a few hundred at a time. This is true in the PBL for 11th century Rus, it's true in Thietmar of Marisburg, it's true in the uh, all kinds of sources, right? Um, and this is a big difference than what we think about when we hear the word war. Conflict is also important as a term because the outright goal is not always to kill your antagonist. And this may seem difficult to believe given what we know or think we know about the past. However, these conflicts were to a, a way to achieve victory. Victory was achieving your result. This could be the death of your foe. More likely, it was something more economical, acquisition of a, a town, acquisition of a trade route, something similar. These goals do not require the death of your antagonist. Adding in the idea that that antagonist was also probably your kin, right, makes sense that you might not want to kill that person. So we've got a kinship web defined as a term and an idea. We've got conflict rather than war. So we're gonna to turn to another, con, uh, another concept, which is the situational kinship network. Now, kin engaging in conflict with kin is as old as time, or at least as old as Cain and Abel. And actually Cain and Abel are relevant here because they're often held up by chroniclers as a negative example for kin who might be in conflict with kin. However, this condemnation is not applied evenly. In fact, it is only applied on an occasional basis. Other examples of kin-on-kin -kin conflict are left silent in our sources in medieval Eastern Europe. I actually think there's more going on here, but, but I can't get into all of that right now. Equally old, though not documented from quite so far back, are strategies that kin enact to avoid drawing in their entire massive web of kin relations, the kinship web in my terminology. Um, the Manuel Comnenos quote it used earlier expresses this very nicely. If one does not limit this killing in conflict, everyone is going to be killed. We, we see a similar thing in the, the literature on feud for Iceland, for example. 
In fact, scholars have worked to determine who can take revenge for whom and, and to what extent for Icelandic stuff. A situational uh, kinship network is an attempt made by individuals who are part of a shared kinship web to create a series of alliances to make war upon one another. So we're going to talk through an example of this in a generic format. So this is just a basic example of a family that we're going to use. In this family, brother A and brother B are going to fight each other, right? They're going to engage in conflict. Yet in order to fight one another and avoid the problem of this spreading throughout their entire kinship web, each side creates what I have termed a situational kinship network. This is a purposeful, and purposeful is important here, subset of their kinship web that each creates to engage in conflict with the other. Brother A has gathered his father-in-law right, and his uncle Brother B has gathered his cousins and his brother-in-law, and each of them used kinship terminology to call on these alliances or to activate these alliances, as I use that term. The two of them, of course, are still brothers, but they've created mutually exclusive kinship networks for the purposes of this conflict. The brothers and their supporters engage in conflict. One wins, the other loses. No one is killed of the brothers. And at the end of the conflict, the kinship networks dissolve. That's why they're situational kinship networks. And the brothers are again part of their shared kinship web. Now one might even see, and in practical examples, this is quite common, that the two brothers might be on the same side of a situational kinship network in the near future, allied to fight against their cousins here. The idea of a situational kinship network is a way to discuss conflict within kin groups. When we have expanded kin groups to include all horizontal as well as vertical natal and marital relations. And with these two concepts, the kinship web and the situational kinship network laid out, we can talk about some practical examples of these and see them in action. This is the base kinship web that we'll use for these examples. And I'm gonna talk about a couple of examples from the 1140s. Um, the examples I'm going to talk about try and uh, demonstrate the utility of this as a concept, um, and we're going to try and keep it relatively finite. I know this is a lot of people already, right? Um, but we're going to try and keep it relatively finite by just drawing on this pool. We can see repetitions, people joining the same situational kinship networks over and over again. Uh, we can also see people leaving and joining different networks. Now, I want to emphasize that this is just one of many ways that people could make series of alliances. We see alliances for economic reasons, financial reasons, territorial reasons, or other reasons. So kinship is, is one of many of those types of reasons. The first example that I'd like to discuss, it has to do with the inheritance of the Mishkovici throne of Poland. In 1138, Boyaslav III dies, and Vladislav II takes over as the head of the family. Actually, according to Boleslav III's will, the land was divided amongst his sons who were of age, but Vladislav II is the primus inter pares. The two main contenders are Vladislav II and Boleslav IV. So here we have Vladislav II, who is the eldest, actually the eldest by a lot, and then we have Boleslav IV. They're going to be the two main contenders that we're going to talk about. They're both sons of Boleslav III, though by different mothers. And as you can imagine, given what I've talked about already and your own knowledge of medieval history, you can see where the conflict lies. Certainly at one level, this could be seen as a conflict internal to Poland. The two are competing for the Polish throne. They're Polish rulers competing for a Polish throne. That's it. But if we look at this more broadly, they're not simply Mishkovici, right, members of this Polish ruling family. They're connected into a much wider web of relations. Vladislav II's mother, Vladislav II's mother, right, is a member of a uh, Volodymyrovici clan. Boleslav IV's mother was Salomea of Berg, which connected her and him into a German family. And if we take this further, we can see that they have their own marital connections, not just natal connections, relations which will stretch their kinship webs even further throughout Central and Eastern Europe. Vladislav II is married to Agnes of Babenberg. Right? Agnes of Babenberg is the daughter of Margrave Leopold III of Austria and Agnes. Agnes was the daughter of Henry IV, the German emperor. 
Um, she was not only, Agnes was not only a member of the Salian dynasty, which had ruled the German empire for decades, but via her mother, she was connected to the new Hohenstaufen dynasty that took control of the empire under Conrad III, right? So Agnes's brother is Conrad III. Vladislav's marriage to Agnes was a big deal, right? This was an incredibly potent dynastic marriage that gave him access to some really powerful uh, in-laws. Boislav IV is no slouch either, right? Boislav IV um, is going to um, uh, get married and Salomea uh, is the one who is going to try and arrange those marriages. And we don't have uh, explicit evidence of that, but we have inference of it from a variety of sources that Salomea is very active in arranging her children's marriages as well as doing things like endowing monasteries and churches. Um, Boislav IV is going to get married, of course, you can see here to Verkoslava. Uh, Verkoslava is a daughter of Vsevolod Mstislavich. Uh, the Mstislavichi are very powerful in Rus at the time, even though at this particular moment in the 1140s, they are not ruling in Kiev. Um, the current ruler of Kiev, Vsevolod Olgovich, was married to a Mstislavichi, right, a Maria Mstislavna, um, demonstrating the importance of those connections. So this is a good tie for Boleslav IV to have made. It also is going to help undercut any ties that Vladislav II is going to draw on from the larger Volodymyrovichi web. This marriage also helps to understand the interlocking ties that I think make the study of these relationships so interesting and situational kinship networks so good as a tool to try and understand them. Because we don't just have here um, two Mishkevichis, right? Vladislav II and Boleslav IV. So we can't talk about a Polish Russian alliance. We have two different members of the Mishkevichi Polish family married to. Uh, different members of other families. And one set of those is drawing on a, a polish Russian example, mishkevichi Volodymyrovichi, and a different mishkevichi Volodymyrovichi relationship. So these are really interwoven families. Right? And that's why I think the kinship web works so well. And then the situational kinship networks work well too, to try and separate out some of these lines that are just uh, on a genealogical chart. We can also, of course, look at all of the very siblings that Boleslav IV has and the marriages that are related to those siblings. Um, we also see Vladislav's son, Boleslav, is married to a different member of the Volodymyrovichi clan. So all of these create a much larger and robust kinship web. Now, Vladislav II inherits from his father. A couple of years go by, things are very peaceful. But in 1141, Vladislav II comes into conflict with Salomea and her sons. Now, the exact cause is difficult to discern from the extant sources, but all of the secondary sources uh, say that it's a struggle for power. It makes perfect sense. This conflict, the first of several, was settled rather quickly in, in favor of Vladislav II, but the manner of its resolution is of interest to us. In preparation for his military campaign, Vladislav II created a situational kinship network out of his much larger kinship web. That kinship web naturally included right, the web, right, all marital and natal relations. So that kinship web included his half-brothers right, and his um, stepmother. But it also included a whole host of people who might not help him. The people he included in his situational kinship network were all involved in the conflict on his side for reasons that they provided for themselves or he provided for them. It's clear from Russian sources that Vsevolod Olgovich, right, here's Vsevolod Olgovich who's ruling at the time in Kiev. Vsevolod Olgovich mobilized his forces to assist Vladislav II due to their shared kinship ties. The Kevin Chronicle specifically records that Vsevolod sent a force consisting of his own son, um, Svetoslav, Izislav Davidich, Vlodomirko of Galich, to assist his Zyat, right, generally brother in law, but in this case, son in law. Um, making clear the kinship nature of that assistance, as does the repetition of the information about the marriage of Zvenislava, here's Zvenislava, Vsevolod's daughter, and Boleslav the Tall in that same entry. It may also be conjectured that the reason Vsevolod agreed to participate in the situational kinship network was in return for Vladislav's participation in his own internal conflicts in Rus. This type of reciprocal assistance was, common, was a common way to motivate people to join situational kinship networks. 
On the other side of the conflict, though, Stalin may have failed in her attempt to create an alliance with the Sievlod Olgovich. Uh, Boyaslav IV was married into the Mstislavici branch of the Volodymyrovichi. Mishko III was married to a sister of the Arpad ruler, uh, Geza II. But neither of these parts of their kinship web were mobilized to assist them during this conflict. The reason behind this illustrates the complex nature of situational kinship networks rather than the clearly delineated lines that I have drawn on this genealogical chart. These lines simply represent people who could be called upon to form a situational kinship network. They then have to be motivated to do that. They have to have their own reason for doing that. They have to be incentivized to do that. Um, and in this case, it, nothing happens. Uh, for instance, Gaze of the Second. Geza II is technically the ruler of Hungary at this time, but he's a minor, uh, and his uncle Belos is in fact the one who is his regent ruling Hungary at this time, and Belos is focused on his internal Serbian affairs rather than anything else. So the view we have in this conflict of 1141 is really not of rival situational kinship networks, but of a well-deployed situational kinship network versus a total lack of one. Salomea acting as Mater Familias, or Boleslav IV and Mishko III acting corporately as brothers, had a robust kinship web that they could have drawn upon to create a situational kinship alliance, but they did not. Kinship was the sine qua non of such alliances, at least in most instances, but it was not the only factor involved. Kin needed to be motivated to participate and to inevitably antagonize other members of their shared kinship web and to risk life and fortune to assist you. A deployment of shared interests was key to that mobilization. It's certainly not that Boleslav IV and his family were not connected. Their kinship web was nearly as robust as Vladislav II's, but they were unable to create the proper incentives for the creation of a situational kinship network to defeat Vladislav II and his allies. Okay, the second example that I'd like to talk about comes from 1144. But before we do that, at the end of the conflict, everything resets. Our situational kinship network is over and our base kinship web is reinstated. Now in 1144, there are multiple conflicts, both drawing on the same larger kinship web to form oppositional situational kinship networks. In Rus, we have a conflict between Vesyevlod Olgovich in red and Volodymyrko Volodarovich um, in blue. Right? They had been part of the same situational kinship network just a few years before uh, when they helped Vladislav II, but now they are in opposition to one another, demonstrating the malleable nature of these situational kinship networks and their utility as an example. Rather than terms such as allies and enemies, which bear the connotation of being fixed, and this change in them can be confusing or can represent the, the uh, bearers as fickle, right? This is a natural process of being situational. The Stavlod Olgovich drew on a host of Volodymyrovich allies, including his brothers Igor and Sviatoslav, Volodymyr Davidich, Vyacheslav Volodymyrovich, two members of the Mstislavici, Izislav and Rostislav, Sviatoslav Stavlodovich, two members of the Vsevlodkovichi, Boris and Gleb, and Rostislav Glebovich. Vesyavlod was also aided in this affair by Vladislav II, once again demonstrating the reciprocity inherent in the activation of situational kinship networks. And I apologize, a lot of these names I've given you just now are not on this chart. As I said, this is a kind of compact version, even though it's quite large. Right? To include everybody, it would need to be even, even bigger, um, which I think would be fun, but might be confusing. So I, I've compressed it a little bit. Now, Volodymyrko of Galich um, created an oppositional kinship network calling upon Geza II, the ruler of the Arpods, for assistance. Geza II and Volodymyrko were part of a kinship web, but the tie was not a recent one, nor are Geza II or specific kinship terminology invoked by the chronicler that records this assistance. It's more likely, in fact, that it was Ban Belos, still acting as regent, who led the Hungarian forces, as the Laurentian Chronicle reports a, quote, Bana Korleva, uh, a royal official titled the Ban, at their head. But other considerations beyond kin, such as geography and economics, may have been part of Geza's or, or Belos's calculations. Vlodomirko's territory shared a border and trade routes with the Arpadian realm, preserving that relationship may have been more advantageous 
been allowing Vasyavlad Olgovich to increase his power or put someone else uh, on the throne of Galich. Now, the inclusion of the Arpads on the side of Volodymyrko, though, was a commitment on their part to a section of their larger kinship web, which did include Boleslav IV and thus the rivals of Vladislav II among the Mishkevichi. This assistance for Volodymyrko, or rather the lack of assistance for other pieces of Giza's kinship web, may have been a result of the ongoing rebellion of Boris Kalamanovich. I would love to get into Boris Kalamanovich. I, I really am fascinated by him, but that takes us in a different direction. So there are other factors than what's on this chart too that we need to keep in mind. Now, the Vasyavod Olgovich and Volodymyrko are primary participants here, and their respective situational kinship networks engage in conflict. Uh, the Vasyavod triumphs pretty easily, actually, according to the limited source base, and the two negotiated a peace settlement. Now, the terms of the peace vary slightly between the sources, um, but there is an interesting acknowledgement in one of the accounts of Vasyavod's situational kinship network. In that account, Vasyavod received a tribute payment from Volodymyrko as part of the peace. And instead of keeping the 1,400 grievances of silver, he, quote, distributed to his brothers, to Vyacheslav, Rostislav, Izislav, and all his brothers who had been with him in the campaign, dividing it among them, end quote. Vysyavod Olgovich did have natal brothers on that campaign, Igor and Sviatoslav Olgovich, but they're not explicitly mentioned here. Instead, the enumerated brothers are Vyacheslav, presumably Volodymyrich, and Rostislav and Izislav, both presumably Mstislavici. Vyacheslav was Maria Mstislavna's, uh, Vasyavlod's wife's uncle, while Rostislav and Izislav were Maria's brothers. Thus, they were kin, but they were marital kin. Further, the quote identifies, quote, all his brothers on that campaign, end quote, which can be interpreted to include all of the individuals named as participants. All of those individuals were, in fact, members of his kinship web, and the alliance was founded on kinship, something acknowledged in Vasyavod Olgovich's statement. Finally, the allocation of wealth adds to the incentive to participate in such situational kinship alliances. Kin may have been the underlying principle, but there are practical reasons for participation as well. So this is over. We reset the situational kinship network back to the entire kinship web. Right? There is another kinship uh, struggle, situational kinship network created in Poland amongst the Mishkevichi. Right? We have Vladislav II again calling on Vasyavod Olgovich. Boyaslav IV is calling on his kinship relations. And we once again have another situational kinship network created that is going to do battle. Right? And I won't narrate the details of this one. Um, but the point of these is that we keep seeing similar patterns emerging. There is a broader kinship web, right? Everybody is related. We create oppositional, kin oppositional situational kinship networks out of that to do battle with one another, right? Now, the individuals in these situational kinship networks come from at least a half different, um, a half a dozen, pardon me, different clans. They represent individual families as subsets within those clans. The histories of the German Empire, Hungary, Byzantium, Bohemia, Poland, Rus are all written typically separately, but they all come together in these examples. And these kinship relations create the deep structure for the political relations. And they use the language of kinship in articulating the need for assistance from one another, even if they also had appreciable gains for their assistance tangible or, or intangible. This model of using situational kinship networks and kinship webs helps historians look past traditional constructed boundaries to see more deeply in the interconnectivity of medieval Europe. Now, okay, to kind of put a bow on all of this and conclude, now the history of Rus is one that needs to be written, I believe, in a much broader context than it has historically been written. I want to break it out of these silos of medieval Europe, Slavic studies, and Byzantine studies because Rus connects all of those and participates in all of those. Right? We limit ourselves when we're just talking about Rus as Slavic studies or England as Western Europe or Byzantium as one silo. My work more broadly, and these two examples specifically, are part of an attempt to situate Rus in medieval Europe and to get scholars to think um, about other ways to do that and to make these connections. I will say I do not have all the answers, nor have I written about all of these connections, 
my work is I would like to suggest a step in trying to make Rus a part of Europe or from the other side to expand medieval Europe to include Rus, but it is not in any way the final word. So please, to all the, the graduate students out there, keep working. <laughs> and to all the faculty members, right? Keep teaching about a wider medieval Europe um, because we need to get that message across and we need to really challenge um, these assumptions about Kiev and Rus and these assumptions about medieval Europe which dominate the field. Thank you all very much for your attention. I appreciate it a great deal. Thank you. Uh, that, was, that was really great. Um, may I remind you, you can use our chat window if you have questions, so you can ask them directly by raising your hand. And um, oh, please, please, Doctor. Thank you, Christian, for your presentation. Um, and I understand uh, the comparison, but I have a couple of questions like about what does it tell us about um, if we think about kingship and kingdom, for example, um, what about the relationship between kings and church and the lack of that relationship in Rus among the uh, rulers of Rus and this uh, interaction with the church or being the head of the church? That's like one question. And the second question is, um, since in my imagination, <laughs> the um, uh, Rus is so fluid, you know, in terms of, um, you know, even talking about the centrality of Kiev. So uh, how do we talk about this um, entity that you would call a kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I'll take them in order if that's all right. Um, so you mentioned in your introduction this new project that I'm working on and, and ecclesiastical relations are a part of that and titulature is a part of that. Um, and one of the things that I found in digging into um, a lot of the literature on this and in the primary sources is that um, we equate kingship with ecclesiastical coronation. Um, and so a bishop or, or a priest or pope puts a crown on your head. Um, but in fact, that's actually really rare um, in the 11th and 12th centuries outside of once again, England and France. Um, those are the areas where that happens most often. In Scandinavia, for instance, we don't have ecclesiastical coronation. The earliest is 1163. Um, and then it kind of goes later in the other kingdoms from there. So the fact that we're really missing that in Rus, I don't think causes us a big problem um, because I think that Rus actually looks much more normative um, than uh, abnormal. And England once again presents a, an abnormal picture that has become normative. Um, we do have a lot of similar relationships, for instance, in regards to relationship with monasteries and family mausoleums and things like that. Um, those are really similar um, relationships between royalty and the church in Rus that we see in what I'm calling the arc of medieval Europe, this kind of Iberia to Ireland through Scandinavia and Eastern Europe, where we have rulers found monasteries, often with their wives, right? So there is a, a bilateral kindred thing there that really gets written out, and, and you've written about this, which has been so helpful, uh, about trying to tie these, these men and women together in the foundation of these monasteries. Um, and that's really similar. So I think there are actually more similarities than differences in those ties. Uh, and titulature is, is interestingly complicated in terms of what we say and what we mean. Um, and so that's, that's part of that. As for Rus, um, you're right uh, that it can be really fluid. And then we get into this nature of what is the Rus land too. Um, there was a, a, a recent book review of a couple of my books in Speculum by a Russian scholar who said these are not worth reading because he doesn't know that Rus is only these three territories and not everything. I'm like, okay, well, that's a little bit of an extreme view. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you read a lot of the stuff about the Rus land and what is the Rus land, it does um, shift uh, over time. But in uh, a longer version of uh, the first part of this kind of debunking of, or, or creation, let's call it a creation of the idea of the kingdom of Rus, um, what we see is that the, the features of the ruler of Kiev 
uh, correspond to many of the features of 11th and 12th century kings, which is that they could call on rulers, uh, subordinate rulers from these other places for goods, for soldiers, for things like that. Um, and that makes them the primus inter pares um, of the family, but it also makes them the, um, uh, or the pater familias of the family, but also the primus inter pares in Rus. So I have examples in which we've got rulers who call on the ruler of Novgorod, who call on the ruler of Suzdal, who call on the ruler of, of Volodymyr for troops to go fight against the steppe peoples. Um, being able to call on those forces indicates, I believe, a centrality of organization and power. We don't see the same thing happen where, for instance, a ruler of Volodymyr um, calls on the ruler of Kiev and the ruler of, of uh, Novgorod for forces. The, the ruler of Kiev is the only one who seems able to do that. After the middle of the 12th century, that does begin to fracture a little bit, but we still actually have a lot more unity than we think, even with the uh, Andrei Bogolubsky's sack of Kiev in the 1160s and things like that, um, we still see Kiev as a center that needs to be held um, to demonstrate any power over the entire entity that is the Volodymyrovichi clan. Um, Bogolubsky, uh, you know, doesn't want to live and rule there, but he does want to hold it. And his brother, Vestiavla III, is acknowledged by all of the other rulers as the eldest in the family. Um, and he then gets to put who he wants in Kiev, and if not, then there's fighting, so. Does that help? Does that try and answer some of that? Yes, it helped, but I'm not 100% convinced. Like, uh, I, still, right. <laughs> I still think about um, different um, sort of developing principalities as being able to call on close kin to form forces against the, let's say, Kievan ruler with uh, his forces. Even with mm -hmm. like Sevalod Oyovich, uh, the perception of him being a ruler of Chernihiv uh, to me and being able to call on Chernihiv forces indicates mm -hmm. to me that uh, there is, I, I guess more, that there is power, this sort of centralizing power also in different um, in the different centers that are developing in Rus. So my, my only issue with that is that I feel like we for so long have been trying to um, sort of sub, uh, break down this notion of a Rus uh, entity, right? Um, that prefigures modern entities, right? Uh, yeah. So my, so I don't, um, I understand the problematics of naming the Rus rulers as princes and how it would cre mm -hmm. create an equivalence with rulers in Western Europe. But I also think that your project will then be even bigger because in a way you then have to set the norm outside, you have to redefine king kingship altogether. Yes. Very much so. Um, absolutely, that's right. And, and that's the real challenge. And when I first started, um, talking about a kingdom of Rus, which was a long time ago, um, that was a common uh, uh, critique was, well, if you're going to do this for Rus, then um, we need to we need to think about all of the titulature. Um, and I was like, okay, I can only do one thing at a time. Um, but, but now I am, right? And so I've written this titulature chapter for this new book project, and it goes through what is a king, what is a queen, what is an emperor, and looks at what these things were at the time. And it talks about... Um, and then there's a co-rulership chapter, how we, how we talk about the Byzantine emperor, but in fact, there are multiple Byzantine emperors at any one time. And in Scandinavia, we've got multiple kings at any one time. And so what are these things? You're right, all of that needs a, a rethinking because when we see kingdom, we really do think of a strong king in a hierarchy, but I think it's really a soft king in almost all of medieval Europe. Um, and that again, this is another bad English example um, that we've internalized. You go tell Queen Elizabeth that. Tell Queen Elizabeth. Oh, well done. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can send you the titulature chapter if you want to read it, uh, Alinka. Okay. That would be great. I'll do it. Oh, thank you. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. All right. Then um, while you are thinking, I'll take a question from our Google form. 
Uh, so the question is, do you think that Rus is a historical heritage of Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus? So this is an interesting question, and it can be a problematic one because it tinges on uh, a, a lot of national issues. Um, Don Ostrovsky, who many of you know or know his work, uh, and I are writing a book together that's uh, The Ruling Families of Rus, and um, we uh, are talking about roughly the 11th through the 15th century, and we talk about how parts of Rus um, become parts of um, Muscovy, Tver, Lithuania, Poland, um, the Crimean Khanate, the Golden Horde, you know, all of these, well, he wouldn't say Golden Horde, of course, I would get in trouble for that. Um, the Kipchak Khanate, um, all of these other sorts of things. So the history of Rus is really this really uh, complicated and fascinating history. Vitaly Mikhailovsky um, uh, wrote about uh, the contested borderland in, in a recent book, um, well, recent in English, he'd written about it in, in Ukrainian earlier. Um, and so I think that there is so much to unpack there. And um, ethnogenesis is um, a really difficult subject, especially given all of the, the loaded uh, questions involved in it. Uh, in our chit chat before we started, I mentioned the Khrushchevsky translation project that um, Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies has undertaken that is now finally finished with the publication of, of volume two. If any of you are interested, they have it on sale through their CIUS.com website, um, and it's 25% off right now, I think. But one of the things that's so great about Khrushchevsky is he was a fantastic medieval historian, um, but parts of that book that really didn't age as well are some of those ethnogenesis kinds of things. Um, and so I think ethnogenesis is, is difficult to discuss with any kind of um, authority. Um, and so I, I would stay out of some of that conversation, but Rus itself is a polity that exists uh, and existed in a borderland world where as it grew and changed, and this is in part reference to what Olenko was talking about, as it grew and changed, right, it became a whole lot of other things. And so it's one of the reasons why I think it's much more productive to look at its history in terms of a horizontal narrative rather than a vertical narrative. Because when you look at it as a vertical narrative, you're always looking at it as uh, pre-Ukraine or pre-Russia. Um, or things like that, that are just going to get you in trouble <laughs> um, because it's its own thing, right? Um, it, it's not pre something else necessarily. That makes sense. Thank you. I know there's also some sort of discussion about the name Kievan Rus. Is it Kievan mm -hmm. or is it just Rus? Mm -hmm. Well, and Kievan Rus is a, is a later accretion, too. Um, so um, one of the interesting things about writing this book with Don Ostrovsky is that um, it is pushing both of us in, in new and interesting ways. And um, Don is very uh, much a creature of the sources and what do the sources say? And, and I often say things that I know that are common knowledge. And he says, well, where does it say that? All right, I don't know that answer. Um, and so we have to go find out. And so we're learning all kinds of interesting things like uh, Yaroslav Mudri. Um, you know, Mudri is a, apparently a 19th century nickname uh, that didn't exist in the medieval world. Um, and uh, Big Nest for Vasilya III um, is a similar one. And, and so there are these, these things that we all know um, that are not necessarily uh, historical, they are part of the nation building scheme of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, Kievan Rus is part of that. Um, the Rurikid dynasty, and Don has written an article about that, is part of the uh, idea of creating a Muscovite state in the 15th century. So when we look at these things through these silos, right, what we're often doing is we're replicating that 19th and 20th century idea of the nation. Um, but hopefully we can get away from that by being medievalists, right? And looking at them in their own context. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's probably what one should do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not what one does, but it's what one should do probably. Okay, um, please, I see the question. Okay, hello, Christian. Um, 
Actually, fascinating presentation. Uh, much appreciated. Thank you. I um, have a, a couple of questions. One, um, I missed uh, the beginning, so you might have addressed that. But I wonder about to what extent um, the earlier, more sort of uh, legendary rulers, um, well, the usual known as uh, in Rus as Rurikovich, right? So is that something that um, normal for dynasties to, to be sort of uh, grounded in legends and then when we actually trace somebody in any sort of documents, then the name of dynasty changes like Volodymyrovich and something like that. So to what extent people who came much later, but, but preceding Romanos, they tend to, or at least the later ones, tend to call themselves Rurikovich, but to what mm -hmm. extent it's, has actually holds any water. So are they? Are they not? And does that term Rurikovich even make any sense? Yeah. And um, the second thing I, I would like you to comment, uh, it's not so much of a question, but but could you uh, comment more on the the project with MAPA? Mm. Did and what um, what is to be done if you think it needs to be expanded? So how uh, let's say students who might be interested in that and only now learning that well there is such resource, how to how is it useful to someone who is not yet as knowledgeable as you are? Yeah. Um Absolutely. So uh, in regard to the first, th there are all kinds of stories in medieval Europe about founders. Um, the Danes uh, in, in the early uh, Gesta Denorum of Saxo Grammaticus were founded by a guy named um, Dan. <laughs> Dan comes and then we get the Danes. Um, and we often have foreigners who arrive on our shores and then create this dynasty. Similarly, the three brothers, um, uh, you know, we have three brothers, of course, uh, in Rus, um, but the three brothers story is also quite common as well. Um, and typically what happens with the three brothers is two of them die or disappear, and then the third one becomes becomes the founder. And, and that's very common, and that's common even into um, New England uh, genealogies in the United States of, you know, three brothers emigrated from England to Massachusetts, and we don't know what happens to two of them, but then one of them, it's, it's just like the Rurik story, it's very interesting. Um, so that is very common, and then later we get the creation, uh, a very self-conscious creation of this history. And so, for instance, in the Nikon Chronicle, uh, Nikon Chronicle, you can read about um, uh, when people take the throne, it is he takes the throne of his father and brother and grandfather and great grandfather, and they trace it back to Vladimir. Whereas in Hypatian and Laurentian, you don't see that traced back that far. Um, but they're trying to create a, a longer sense of identity. Um, as for Mappa, yeah, certainly. I mean, there are so many things that you can do with Mappa. Um, let's see. I'm hoping this works. All right, so if we go to the map and we go to historical atlas, Rus genealogy, and then the web map. So there's a whole lot that you can do here. And so for instance, if you wanna click on this line, you can learn about this marriage that happens to be represented here or a marriage that goes with to Sweden. But one of the things that I think is especially interesting, and I have, you can turn modern boundaries on, but I have it defaulted to off because I don't want to see those modern boundaries, is if you do something like play with this time slider. And so, for instance, if we just want to see 11th century marriages, we can just see 11th century marriages. And you can see largely they're going east and west. Right, and so we can look at a particular trend of marriages that is happening at this, oh, sorry, I zoomed in, uh, at this time. But if we shift this and we look at 12th century marriages, you can see this is a very different picture. Um, and the marriages aren't going farther, they're not going as far to the west, and they are mostly located um, in Eastern Europe. 
So this is one of the ways that you can play with this kind of a tool. Similarly, you could look at marriages that are just with Byzantium, right? And it will highlight those connections. Or you can look at marriages that are just with, um, just from Kiev, right? So this is a way that you can learn a lot from this tool. And the way I would like to grow it, and um, uh, here he's given me permission to, to try and expand this project, is this is centered among the dynasty that, that I call the Volodymyrovici. I would love to um, add on uh, another, for instance, color of marital lines to have the Mishkevici or the Arpad dynasty or others. So you can see the truly interlocking nature of all of these. Um, and this is a, technically doable project. I just need um, time and resources to, to try and make it happen. So does that, uh, does that help with your, your question or, or answering your, your uh, statement? No, that's interesting uh, to me, but I hope it's also interesting to people who see it for the first time yeah. in the audience. And I uh, just to um, write it to, to the first one. So essentially, all those uh, dynasties that you call and others call and maybe call themselves, like Mr. Slavich, Volodymyr, mm -hmm. they also thought of themselves as being Rurikovici, or they actually didn't think in those terms. Mm -hmm. so Rurikovici I... was a term that was used at the time by anyone, or is that no. also a later invention? Right, it is a 15th or 16th century invention. Um, and they definitely think of themselves in my period of the 11th and 12th century as kin. They're all part of a larger clan, a clan that I, I term um, anachronistically as the Volodymyrovici. Um, they certainly think about that and they talk about themselves as families within that larger clan. But, um, but no, Rurikovici um, is a, a later invention as a term. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I see we have one more question from Alexi, please. Uh, Professor, thank you so much for uh, your interesting presentation. And I absolutely get your idea that uh, in terms of uh, their uh, position and role in medieval Europe, um, Kiev uh, princes were equal to kings. But don't you think that uh, actually um, term, the term uh, prince uh, or oh, translating Knaz as prince uh, makes perfect sense if we remember that uh, um, uh, actually uh, the uh, uh, emperor was in Constantinople. That's why they were princes. And uh, a second part of my question is, uh, um, what do you think about uh, uh, Danilo Ralecki's uh, coronation? Uh, what was uh, uh, the idea of that coronation if uh, he, as a князь, was uh, already equal to kings? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think actually there, the answers to both of those parts are very related. I mean, we see a similar coronation, um, or at least a, a similar giving of title in the 11th century when Yaropolk Izislavich goes to visit the Pope with his wife, Kunigunda, um, and uh, the Pope, Gregory VII, gives the Regnum uh, Russorum uh, to Izislav, right, via Yaropolk. Right, so he's, he's giving him the kingdom. I mean, the Pope can't give him the kingdom, right? But, but um, this is the same sort of thing of investing him with that power. Um, the, um, Gregory VII gave out a lot of, uh, of crowns um, at the time in the 11th century as a way to try and bolster his power. Zvonimir of Croatia is another one. Um, the same thing went on with Danilo. Danilo needed uh, assistance or wanted assistance against the Mongols. And so getting uh, authority from the papacy um, was an important part of that. And I don't think the crown was elevating his title. It was uh, it was putting him within the um, aegis, the the uh, orbit of the papacy. I mean, I think that's really what that was about. Um, and and I think the Byzantine emperor um, is not really a Byzantine emperor in a political sort of way. He doesn't rule over Rus in any fashion. And in fact, there are um, recent works. Um, by Anthony Caldella suggesting that, in fact, 
the um, Emperor uh, Basileos is actually a better uh, translated as king, um, and that this modern idea of empire and emperor is modern. Um, and that it conforms to a, a, a political science definition of one ruler uh, uh, from a group ruling over other groups um, that didn't really exist at the time. And, and so he's working together a lot of various ideas to um, shift how we understand the medieval Roman Empire. So, I mean, I think that that tries to answer both of the waves of the question you had there. Thank you. Thank you so much. That Oh, hold, there's one question in the, the chat. Do you mind if I try and answer that, Oksana? Oh, um, yeah. All right. Um, yes, I think, um, Eugene, um, uh, I think that that is 100% true that this has changed. Um, and I think it's actually graduate students and young scholars who are driving that change. Um, and I think that there are a lot of older scholars who are pretty set in the ways that they do things. Um, and so, uh, one of the parts of uh, Olenka's introduction that, that honestly um, uh, flattered me the most was um, her statement that I try to encourage young scholars. And that's something that I really do want to do um, because, you know, it sounds corny, but, but they're the future, right? They're the ones who have the most malleable and interesting ideas who are going to shift and change things for the future. So I, I think that there really are new approaches that are more inclusive um, nowadays. And one of the things that is so popular in Anglophone medieval studies right now is the global Middle Ages. Um, and I get why it's popular, but one of the things that makes me crazy about it is that the global Middle Ages connects England and France to Africa and India, um, but still left out is, is uh, Eastern Europe. <laughs> um, it's still all of the things that we are interested in. And so um, I think we do still need to push that broader inclusivity um, and we still need to look for the ways to make those connections happen. And yes, there is absolutely more scholarship coming out that does those things, um, but I think we need even more. So I, I recently did a bibliography of everything published in the 21st century on Roost by Anglo-American authors. And it blew me away how much stuff there was. There was so much stuff. Um, and so that was heartening uh, that there's a lot of work going on. So, and that'll be at russianstudies.hu um, that's doing that project. So they have a Muscovite bibliography up right now, but then um, I did a Kievan one that'll be up sometime later. So thank you for your question. I want to thank you. Thank you all for participating in this discussion. It was very productive. Thank you so much, Christian. Thank you so much, Olenka. And, um, um, I hope that this is not the end of, 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 the, of the discussion. And now I would like to um, say a few words about our next event. So we have um, an event coming up in our series on June 23rd. This is a talk by Dr. Krasinska, a Howard University fellow about roots, forms, and influence of informal civic engagement in Ukraine. We'll announce it a week before the event. And um, so you are more than welcome to join us. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you all.